the Chief Development Officer for the Open Source Digital Voting Foundation. Without further ado, Gregory Miller. You need to change my slides. So. Thanks, Joe, for that more proper introduction. We avoided all those imperialistic running dog lies that PR generates for me. Um, as soon as my screen warms up here, we'll get started. So, um, so good morning. Uh, I should say right up front that it may be a bit of a misnomer if, if you don't understand what, what a CDO is. <laughs> it's not what you think. Um, my hope this morning was to actually surprise everybody with a, with a ringer guest, and uh, my chief, our chief technology officer was supposed to stay overnight. He's here in town for, on other work, and he was going to come in this morning and, and do a, a, a serious deep dive on our technical architecture, um, and he has the appropriate deck to do so. Unfortunately, due to commitments back in Palo Alto, he wasn't able to remain overnight couldn't twist his arm on it. So my deck is slightly different, um, but we'll still talk about the overall project and, and a lot of the, the technical aspects of what we're doing. And, and therefore, as a poor segue, the chief development officer has, is responsible for keeping the foundation alive, keeping the project rolling, working with our partners, um, working with our donors, our grant organizations like the KPOR Foundation, the Ford Foundation, et cetera. Um, some of our partners, the uh, HP Labs, uh, for example, um, Apple, Google, um, SRI, the Stanford Research Institute, um, universities back east, etc. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. So, so although all of us are are um, technical by credential and history, and we all work on various aspects of the project, um, as the thing has grown, my responsibility has shifted away uh, from that uh, pungent smell of freshly cut code. Um, to uh, that pungent smell of freshly donated money. I'm not sure which one's more pungent. So this morning we're going to talk a little bit about the overall project, how we got to be where we are today, and a, and a little bit about our technology and, and, and what's going on. Um, what you need to understand, I think, to, to start is that and, and you might, you should know this. It was interesting because before the talk, I was speaking with somebody who said, you know, um, I was barely a teenager um, when the 2000 election occurred and we had the whole near constitutional crisis with Bush v. Gore. And unfortunately, we had to have these cl clowns and black moomoos decide who the next president would be. Um, I can say that as a recovering lawyer. But without a doubt, um, we have a problem that has persisted, if not become rather aggravated over the past 10 years, and you can see it here before you. It all came out of something called the Help America Vote Act in 2002, which was the, uh, the then administration's effort to create some legislation to cure the problem of the hanging chad. Um, for those of you who are not aware, the way things used to be done were little punch cards where you took a stylus and you actually punched a piece of a hole out. And sometimes those things didn't punch all the way through. And if one was left hanging, there became a question of voter intent because you might have cards where there were two punched. One punched all the way through, one hanging. Which one was the one that was intended? In short, what we've learned um, is that the casting and counting of votes or the process of our democracy cannot be privatized. It turns out that privatization of this in 2002 was just to the right of privatizing Social Security in terms of the, of the prospective outcomes. So the Help America Vote Act was designed to encourage states to get rid of their old lever machines and their punch cards in favor, for, uh, uh, in favor of computerized devices that could effectively help better count the vote. Um, in some cases, that meant, well, let's help cast the vote as well. So the very thing that was supposed to make things better hasn't. Um, and, and simply, the problem is we have this train wreck, right? Whenever you have a commercial interest and you have a public interest on the same tracks, you know who's going to win. And you really can't fault them because they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to maximize their, their, the company's performance. Therefore, when it came to voting technology, it was how little did we have to invest? 
to build a machine that we could sell and how much of a margin could we make on that machine and then make our money on the, the annuity on the servicing of that machine. Let's do uh, as little as possible. But the results of that really, quite frankly, are absurd. 80, I said last night, 86% of America's voting systems, election systems, are controlled by just two vendors. And of that pool of voting equipment across the entire United States, two-thirds of it claim to be state-of-the-art. And this is the state-of-the-art operating system that they use. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Um, there's still a lot of Z80 out there at the hardware level. And as I said, the results are really quite absurd. Um, and it's not certain that there's any motivation on the part of industry to improve that. But um, here's what we have. So um, as a result, we, uh, we took a look at this in 2006 and said, um, that's, that's absurd. Things aren't getting better, they're actually getting worse. And so in November, November of 2006, um, inside the walls of a venture capital firm where I was working, uh, we were basically doing a brown bag for new, new interns on the whole notion of market, what we call disintermediation and, and innovation and sourcing new ideas. And we, for a vehicle for discussion, we took up the voting systems industry because after all, it was November 2006, we had the Ohio debacle, uh, we'd had problems in 2004, we had problems in 2000. We said, what's wrong with this industry? And so as we whiteboarded it out, we began to realize that we had a malformed, dysfunctional marketplace with no incentive to, to, to innovate. In fact, arguably a disincentive to innovate. So we asked ourselves, we all know how bad, quote, e-voting is. We all know the problems of these machines. We've seen all the wonderful experiments and demonstrations from Rice University and Carnegie Mellon, the University of Michigan, and elsewhere about how these machines are, are easily, Purdue and, of course, easily compromised. What if we were to start with a clean slate? What if we were to assume no legacy, no incumbency, but to just clear the board and start from the ground up? Shouldn't we be able to, to build a voting system, an election system with, 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 uh, with voting machines that would engender a better level of trust? So specifically, we said, look, there's, there's, there's four things that we really know that if we're going to do this, um, we have, to, we, we have to achieve. And the first thing we realized was there really was no commercial opportunity here. So as venture capitalists, we said this might be the one place where the application of open source technology is not just a good idea, it's an imperative idea. It's essential to this, this you know, cornerstone of democracy. So what if we build this project to see if we can deliver this technology and then hand it over to commercial vendors who are capable of installing it, deploying it, supporting it, etc. So we said, well, let's set out some charter for ourselves. Um, and we, we, the, we stated these four things were actually should be the cornerstones of what we're going to do. And the vehicle for doing that is what, uh, well, so the Open Source Digital Voting Foundation, which soon will become known as the Open Source Elections Technology Foundation, by the way, um, has launched a number of projects. One of them is the project to actually build this technology. The other, another is a project to maintain the repository of the technology. So the Trust the Vote project um, is really the, the focus of what we're doing now. We actually do give grants of money to other uh, small projects that are components of what we're doing. And the, one of the very first things we, we, we realized was this notion of a black box proprietary system, one lumbering monolith was not the way to go. It has all kinds of problems from, from audit and verification all the way through to testing and certification. What we said was we have to establish four corners of our technology. So all of our technology from the point of producing requests for comments that we circulate amongst our stakeholders to then developing requirements to building to, to specifications to actually building things has to be done with these four things in mind. Now, we have a challenge, and I spoke a little bit about this last night, which is the nature of the open source environment really begs us to be agile, 
to enjoy the, the chaos of the bazaar, so to speak, and still realize that we're working in what we call a fault-tolerant environment or high-assurance computing environment, which tends to want more the cathedral model, a top-down, structured, disciplined approach to ensure the quality of the technology. We actually mix those two together in kind of a yin-yang experiment, and it seems to be working. Uh, it's, it's managed by a core team, which I'll explain in a few minutes. But whenever any project is underway, we're always thinking about these four things. Are we ensuring accuracy? Are we absolutely guaranteeing transparency? Are we making certain that what we're doing is verifiable and it is secure? And the reason for that's really quite simple. We're dealing with nothing short of critical democracy infrastructure. This stuff is too important to get wrong and it's too important to be black boxed. So let's look a little bit at the ecosystem. So I mentioned a moment ago that the, the typical architecture of a voting machine or voting system is sort of the monolithic approach. We've got a closed system that's comprised of one or two devices. And the first thing we wanted to do was sort of blow that up and say, no, it really needs to be highly componentized. We need to have application-specific, single-purpose devices for each part of the entire ballot ecosystem. So. There should be devices for marking ballots, and there should be devices for counting ballots, and there should be devices for tabulation and canvas, et cetera. One device for one purpose so that we can isolate it and control the, what goes in and what comes out. And we have a much more auditable system. It's more easily verified. And frankly, it, it plays to the transparency model. So beginning from the very point of when a ballot is defined and when a voter is registered to vote, our project addresses the entire ballot ecosystem. Yes, arguably it looks like we're boiling the ocean, but we've taken, we're trying to take this a beaker at a time and break it into its constituent components. And to do that successfully, we spent a number of years, I mean more than two years, doing not much more than working on two pieces, the common data layer and an election manager or a management service layer that would handle that data. This is not trivial work and at the same time, it's rather boring. I liken it to non-technical audiences. I explain it as driving by that new skyscraper that's going up, and for weeks, if not months, you see a hole in the ground with a lot of rebar and a lot of concrete and a lot of foundation, and you have no idea what that building's gonna look like, but you know they're doing something. And we spend a lot of time working in the foundation because it's clear that if we don't get the data model right, we can't achieve what we wanna achieve. And what we are trying to do here, and bear in mind that we have a heavy amount of influence from the Mozilla Foundation, from Netscape, from Apple and Google, um, that influence has taken um, several roles within this ecosystem. It's taken at the data layer, it's taken at the application service layer, and it's taken at the presentation layer. And you can probably guess which companies are working where. Um, but the notion is to build an entirely object-oriented architecture that allows for a very malleable framework that enables us to deploy this in any jurisdiction in the country. And let me back up for a moment and explain why that's important. How many of you believe, or is it true or false, I should say, that the federal government is responsible for setting the election standards for how elections are conducted in the United States? How many think that's true? Great, we have a nice intelligent audience. Because the fact is, election law is not federal. Despite the fact there's a Federal Elections Commission, despite the fact there's, there's an Elections Assistance Commission, elections are a local matter. And there has been this huge balkanization phenomena that has pushed elections down to the lowest level called a precinct, which rolls up to a county, which rolls up to a state. And if you think about it, a national election day here is a near miraculous illustration of how a democracy works. Because we ask over 7,000 jurisdictions in the country to all produce results that in a matter of less than 24 hours we can declare a winner for the office of the president of the united states and all other federal seats as well as state and local uh, and county initiatives contests and candidates pretty miraculous and yet i can tell you after four years of following this with my entire heart um, it's bound together by Elmer's glue and bailing wire and rubber bands. It's unbelievable how it works. It just shouldn't work. Um, it's pretty crazy. Um, and the result is that there is lots of room for error. And for many years, if not decades, we didn't care about that margin of error. We announced 
poll results on the East Coast before the West Coast polls had closed. We projected winners, and it, we went along and did this for decades until 2000 when we ran into a train wreck and people had to start saying, wait a minute, we can't call this election, we're not right. The problem is, is that in the digital age, by definition, all elections will be close. All races will be contestable. And so the swag factor has left, and now elections can be decided by margins of error that are within those reporting that don't even allow us to actually call an election. So the need to have more accurate ways of tabulation is imperative. And our approach, we believe, does this by breaking this down into its constituent components. Now, it turns out that there are, there's considerable movement in the United States to say, get rid of all the machines. All ballots should be counted by hand. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly considerable movement to do that. And it's a great idea. Except that what people don't understand is that we have a constitutional infrastructure that absolutely prohibits that, even if we all agreed we wanted to do it. And here's why. We have over 175 million ballots that were presented for the last election. We estimate that that's going to close in on 190 million in the next general election. It is not possible to hand count 190 million ballots within a 24-hour period to declare a winner. And why does it have to happen so quickly? Because constitutionally, we have a certification process that means, A, on the 21st of January, there has to be an orderly transfer of power. Nothing can be left in lurch. You can't have a president who holds on because the other president hasn't been decided yet. It constitutionally can't work that way. Before that can happen, a month earlier, you have to have a certification within Congress. They have to basically certify the results as being authentic. And before that, you had to roll up 7,000 precincts. So if you just back annotate to get to where the point is, you realize there are no do-overs in this system. As much as we think there ought to be, there aren't. So machines are here to stay in this digital democracy, and for tabulation at least. But it doesn't end just there. It actually has to go all the way through and recognize that we have several million overseas voters that we have to deal with as well and we have to bring their ballots in too. So there's not only precinct level, level counting that occurs, there's roll-up counting, or what's called tabulation, or central ballot, because you don't count absentee ballots and overseas ballots as they're mailed in or delivered at the precincts. You actually count those um, at, at the, either the, the uh, jurisdiction level, the county, or on up at the state level, okay? Depending upon the size of the jurisdiction. So there's another whole process that comes, uh, comes in later. So the framework is basically built, um, and, and I saw a couple hands. I, I definitely want to go interactive on this. I much prefer to take questions and spend my time blathering here. So give me a couple minutes to get through this. Um, the election framework basically utilizes this environment for what we do. All right, so we have a hardened Linux kernel that was rewritten from the ground up with help from friends of ours at Berkeley, uh, and Cal Berkeley is, is one of our academic partners in this. Um, and on top of that, we layer a super light operating system. Um, there's no reason for you to have all the device drivers that live in a typical OS distribution, right? So if you look at the the, the weight, the largest, that represents a Linux distribution today, right? Um, multiple millions of lines of code. So we have shrunk this down so that our kernel plus loss is a little under 400,000 lines of code in total. So that's produced a pretty high, high performance device, uh, um, operating system for our application specific devices. Those devices include a ballot marking, ballot marker, a ballot counter, um, the tabulators, those are all independent focused devices. So for tabulation, for example, we're working with HP Labs. And, and all of this, all of the software is open source. Obviously, just need to say it, just in case, you, in case you're wondering. Um, so we, we, take an, we take an HP Lab, uh, HP Labs is helping us take a high speed HP scanner. And one of the things we discovered about this, this really malformed industry and how there's no incentive to innovate, the mark and sense algorithms that are used to read, op-scan read a marked ballot, are algorithms that are over 50 years old. There has been no attempt to improve the performance of those machines, and they run at about 97.8% accuracy. 
We got together with HP Labs, and we now have an HP scanner that's running this software suite, our software suite, on, on this hardened kernel. And we're performing at five nines. We're getting 99.999% accuracy. And one other little benefit, we've improved the throughput of ballot processing ninefold. So we're running nine times faster than the leading ESNS ballot counting device that's in production today in 38 states. And ours in the lab is running nine times faster with five nines accuracy using open source code in, a, in, in this project, non-commercial. The reason is simple. We weren't constrained by the commercial dictates to get a product to market in a certain price performance ratio with a certain margin to make our shareholders happy. We were given the mission and the mandate to build the best possible counting device we could and then build the best possible marking device that we could and the best possible ballot design studio system that we could without those constraints because this is publicly owned public infrastructure and it's that important. We can't do it alone. And to, to achieve what we're achieving really takes a community of people and that's what we're doing. So the Trust the Vote project has a core team of technologists um, about nine of them right now, full-time senior level uh, architects who work with a variety of groups as you see unfolding here before you. So we have several organizations that we work with such as Rock the Vote. So Rock the Vote's a big partner of ours. We have completely re-engineered their third-party voter registration system. Um, universities, I mentioned Berkeley, Stanford. Um, we're working with Cal Caltech MIT on the Caltech MIT project, Carnegie Mellon, Purdue. Um, Wilson, the University of South Alabama, and University of Texas. Um, corporations, never thought this would happen. Kind of a bizarre windfall uh, benefit of this, of, this, of this project is we've had corporations who have no business and want to have no business in election systems, but they have core technologies that matter, right? So Oracle has stepped up with us because they now have MySqueal, and they're working with us to make sure that we have certain drivers for MySQL so that we can continue that project. So despite Oracle's consumption of Sun, they're trying to do something in the open source world that makes sense because they see the value, the goodwill that this pretends. Apple, they know a thing or two about user interfaces. They know a thing or two about touch screens. And we know that touchscreen voting systems have been the single source of most of the problems. We got some things in the work that are pretty exciting there too as well. Um, Google is helping us at the very large scale um, database problems that we address and some of the issues there around common data formats, et cetera. Uh, Red Hat and uh, the Linux Foundation work with us, Mozilla Foundation and us work closely together. Uh, some of the, the presentation layer stuff, we're using sort of a modified browser uh, that we've put together for uh, the internal uh, systems in the back office. Elections officials, we couldn't do this without them. We know how to build great code, but we don't know a darn thing about elections, and so we've been in a crash course learning over the last four years. And then that, that brings us to the stakeholder community, which is comprised of election systems officials, um, um, voting systems technology specialists, domain experts from universities, all in this stakeholder community who review all of our work because although we work in an agile fashion, we have another team in shadow that is formalizing this work. So we use a agile development environment for prototyping. As prototypes get to be pretty solid, we then commit to specification documents and what we call RFCs or requests for comments. For those of you familiar with the Internet Engineering Task Force, we work in the same fashion. We have, an, we have a, an RFC process that we work with these folks so that we know that we're building something that they're actually going to be able to adopt, adapt, and deploy. So when we get started, we had about eight states, representatives of eight states who were, who were helping us um, figure out what should the specs be. Um, today, we have uh, over 23 states um, with representatives of those 23 states. And what's really important is the fact that our work is now impacting over 62% of the nation's electorate. That is now a movement. That is now momentum. That is enough now um, to have one overseas vendor um, forewarn us that they intend to file a lawsuit against us, a patent infringement, claiming that the work that we're doing is infringing patents of their commercial systems that they uh, deploy for, for voting. Uh, and we have a U.S.-based company that is looking at possible litigation against us because they're finally realizing that um, we're not going away. 
So let's talk about uh, three innovation examples today. Now, I want to warn you. <laughs> These are going to be oh duh exercises as you see this, right? But you have to understand the technology threshold for the typical voting precinct in the United States, right? So um, what do you think the average age of an elections official is uh, today in the United States in a precinct? Anybody? Just. So I heard 29 or 65, one more. The average age of an elections official when you account for all 7,000 precincts across the United States is 59 years, seven months. Our gentleman here is just under the average, so he is probably on, he's on the younger side of the crew. Uh, I'm, I, I have worked, we've all at the, at the Trust the Vote Project, all of us have worked in, in polls and polling places and have, have gotten in the trenches and worked. Um, I'm getting to my mid-50s, so um, that's where it is. Now, <clears throat> with some more work that was done by Pew, uh, what do you think is the number of years of computer experience that the average precinct worker has? Now, not an election official, now I'm talking precinct worker, which includes everyone who comes in to, to volunteer. I'd say under three years, probably closer to under a year. <clears throat> so the average amount of, com of experience using a personal computer amongst all of the people who run the America's elections is seven months. Okay? Seven months experience, average age up there very close to 60. Okay? In the United States, where do you think is the most common polling place in terms of physical premises? You know, a, you know, a, a post office, a university, what, what do you, where do you think is the most common place? What was that? <laughs> You're actually really close. Another one? So the most common place is local elementary school. The second most common place, believe it or not, are churches. So this is how it works. These machines are shrunk wrap, palletized, and drop shipped at the back end of these buildings a few days before the election. And I probably should just step aside and let him tell the story because I can't make this stuff up. I can't make this stuff up. Books are dropped off and because of the whole issue after 2002 in Hava, the ability for the vendors to be on site helping is greatly restricted. It's almost the transom case I described last night. Everything has to be sufficiently documented so that a 63-year-old church supporter can unwrap these boxes, open them up, and set them up in time for an election that happens tomorrow. Get the machines running, test them out, make sure everything's good to go. That, that's, that's where we're at, okay? So when I describe these examples, bear in mind that what we think is trivial, boring innovation to them is rocket science to the extent that they're now in therapy. <laughs> so let's start with registration at the base of the ecosystem. So we, anticipate, we anticipated that for the 08 election cycle, there were going to be five million new registered voters in the United States. And in fact, that number was a little over that. And the vast majority of new voter registration is handled by so-called third-party registrars. Okay, Rock the Vote, the League of Women Voters, Student Perks. These are the organizations who canvass, bring in people and register them. How do they do it? Well, their state-of-the-art system amounts to someone going up to a computer, and just recently that was moved to the web. Oh my God. And they go to an interface and they type in all the information about themselves to register to vote. Then, because we have to have a wet ink signature for, for authentication, they have to, they print out, they send to their printer the results of that form they did on screen. Well, the good news is, is that they typed it in so they don't have to worry about reading their scribbling, right? And we can do address correction and we can make sure that they got the, all that right, right? Okay, so they print, sign, seal, and mail. And off it goes to the elections officials. And these things generally show up about a week before the deadline for registration. So when these pallets of boxes of registration forms darken the doorsteps of these elections officials, what do you think happens? Believe it. All these forms are taken out and opened up, their signatures are inspected, and they're handed to a data entry pool 
who puts them up on a prop and proceeds to re-key the data into their election management system, reintroducing all the errors and omissions that were taken out by the third party registrar in the first place. So a friend of ours from Time Magazine who was doing some research on this um, did a mad scramble in the summer of 2008 and realized that there was going to be required about 700 work weeks using current population of, 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 pool of people who do this to process these forms. In 2006, two weeks after the election, several boxes of voter registration forms were found in a hallway in an office in New York that were never processed. So we came along and we said, we got a really dumb idea. What if we took all that data on that form that they're working on screen and we encapsulated it into a barcode? And then when they print that out and sign it and seal it, while they're online at Rock the Vote, Rock the Vote takes that and sends a postulate record to the state of destination, where it's cached and sits in a holding pool. The form now arrives in LA County, for example. They open it up, and instead of rekeying the data, they just ship it through a scanner. The scanner picks up the barcode, says, do we have a postular record to match this piece of paper? Yes, we're done. Voter registered. Oh, by the way, we picked up the, digit, the signature on the way too, scanned it, and we now have a digital copy of the authentic wedding signature. We knocked that estimate from 714 weeks down to 12 weeks. This is what has gotten the Google Foundation, the Ford Foundation and people behind us because it's this kind of efficiency and this kind of improvement that becomes enfranchising. Simple, silly example, but that's the kinds of innovation we're doing. Let's look at another one. So the digital poll book. So poll books are these large, I mean, y'all voted, large printouts Wump, that sit on the desk, you know, in the folder, and they flip them open, and they take the ruler down, and they rule out your name, right? And I'll guarantee you it's the most disenfranchising experience you've ever had. I've seen lines that stretch for hundreds of yards down the city street, you know, at 7 o'clock at night in the pouring down rain in Mobile, Alabama. What do you think those people are going to do? They're going home. So the notion of an electronic pull book came up a couple of few years ago, um, and they're based on Windows 95, and they use these lumbering uh, machines that they would sit at the counter. Their laptops weren't even here yet. They were just desktop machines. They now have gotten to laptops. And the current state of the art is to have a laptop running around, and the unit cost is about 3000 bucks. Okay? And they have this system on it that still has a lot of errors in it. So we came along and we said, why? So we rethought what a digital pull book should look like. And digital pull books now, all open source space, are these lightweight devices, you might recognize it, that allows people to walk around the lines and check people in on the fly. They sign their signature right there on the screen, and then we print out their ballot on demand. Oh, by the way, no more shrunk wrap stacks of ballots. Yeah, I'm from Oregon. We don't like to kill trees so much. And so we now have ballots on demand. Now, this is forward thinking because the architecture gets flexible and extensible. So if you're thinking ahead here, you're saying, ah, I can imagine maybe this could work someplace where I can't get home in time. And the system could look up and determine what jurisdiction I'm voting in and print out the ballot that I'm supposed to have. What about those people who ended up in the wrong line? Well, we've, we have an app for that. And what we do is we basically look up their name and their registration on the fly and we can tell them what precinct they're supposed to be at and we can print out a map for them, and we can radio ahead to the proper precinct and say, hey, don't forget Joe, he's on his way over, have his ballot ready. So that's just a brief example of what we're doing in the poll book stage. One more. Election night reporting. So in election night reporting, basically the way it works today is the commercial election management system spews out these proprietary data formats um, that are presented up on a screen, and from that data, they come out and they produce results. And then these results are printed out or they're put on the media and they're shipped out to all the news stations and every place else, and they have this data coming in. And they literally are shuttling data sets all night long to the TV stations. That's the old way of doing things. 
Well, then they got a little bit tricky and said, well, maybe what we could do is we could just generate a results file and we could somehow ship that around, maybe, maybe even digitally, right? No matter what, up, up until last year, what they had to do was take the results of that file and manually re-enter it into a system. Same errors and emissions problem again, right? So we came along. Now remember, what I told you about earlier is this common data format that's running all of our technology infrastructure, the framework, right? Once you get that right, the ability to start adding these kinds of applications and services get easier and easier. So we came in and said, well, okay, we improved that a little bit for them, and we turned it into a PDF that we could ship up to a web page. And so you could see how Barney, uh, uh, see how Fred and, and, uh, and, um, and his cast of characters uh, did in their election. We improved upon that a little bit by saying, instead of doing a, just a PDF, why don't we publish an, a data stream? Then things began to change. Because now, people could come in and write applications to that data service and begin producing results. And the Trust the Vote system has taken um, printouts, basically Word documents, and through an API that allows it to be expressed across any sort of media service, we now have a whole new system out there entirely open. Now you'll note that there still is a locked CD there, and there still is a little bit of sneaker net involved. That's, that's, a, that's a regulatory requirement. The regulatory requirement in the majority of states are um, the, elect, the local election official, that's Leo, the local election official's machine cannot be connected to the commercial election management system and the internet. That's called an airlock and we can't have that. So they have to have this one process. But we now get results like this. So we're building a system for Travis County, Texas where you'll be able to literally Browse around a map, click on it, and see how things are performing. And you get a whole new world of how the data results actually look. We also can deploy it now across multiple devices, and we have people who are writing services against that, that feed. And it's pretty simple, right? So all we're using is just basically JSON to, to express these elections results and make them very easy for anyone to, to get at. So the benefits, I think, are pretty clear for something like this. We're taking proprietary data and moving into common data formats. Um, we're getting election results out in human-friendly slices now available across multiple, multiple channels. We have re uh, results data um, in really software-friendly structures and segments, as you saw with the JSON. And the data is fully accessible and transparent. So now, in Texas, television stations will be taking these feeds live. There's no more shuttling. And they actually are expressing them up on their television, on their, on their monitors, so you can see the, sc the stuff scrolling across the bottom now that you used to see because someone was feeding it in the back room. Now it will be coming directly out of the EMSs. So the nice thing about this is, is that the same common data formats that we're using in our tabulator uh, and election manager are used to produce the results. We have, they're, uh, they're available for independent compilation, which is really important because part of the verification and validation thing that everyone is screaming for is making this data available for anyone who wants to look at it and check for themselves to see if they saw any problems. And our stuff's gained some good uptake, right? So the IEEE um, has now uh, granted us a submission for our data formats to become an IEEE standard. And we have actually uh, implement, implemented the tabulator software part of this for certification with the Federal Elections Assistance Commission. You may remember from last night I talked about this big certification problem. Uh, this is probably what's uh, engendering the, the enthusiasm of litigators and commercial companies because um, we now have the federal government saying, uh, and NIST, especially the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, what they're doing deserves certification and ought to become a standard across uh, elections infrastructure across the country. And that standard will be 100% pure, unadulterated open source. So milestones about the, for the foundation. This is a slide I always, always have to give when I'm sitting down with you know, people like the Soros Fund to tell them why we're doing, what we're doing matters. Um, the, the techies aren't so worried or concerned about it, except you might want to see where we're going uh, forward, where we've come and where we're going. Um, and 
right now, over the next two years, we're, we're halfway into that cycle now, um, very aggressively working on the digital poll book, um, the ballot design studio. The ballot design studio, real quickly, so ballot design is like this crazy process where you hire in a graphic artist and they lay out a ballot according to rules and regulations called ballot styles, and they produce these, you know, these ballots, right? And we said, well, what if we built a web service that allowed you in a very direct manipulative fashion, drag and drop, build up your ballots on right there in this ballot studio, and then from there, send them into the system and, and, and generate them. Um, that's what the ballot design studio is all about. And everything is expressed, again, in XML for maximum portability. Um, we're hoping to start field testing some ballot casting and counting systems. We have a ballot marking device um, that I can't show you today, but again, using that same sort of a touchscreen interface that allow that prevents things like undervotes and overvotes. Like you know, you didn't vote for this contest. Did you not intend to vote for this contest? If so, fine, we'll skip the next one. But check you at the door before you forget. And obviously, it's impossible to vote twice. That's about it on that. And now I can open up for questions. And I really appreciate you guys holding on to your hands. So. You in the back. Good. I knew you were going to ask me a great technical question. I'm like the one I didn't write down in my head. Um, good question for John Sebas, our CTO, um, because I'm not going to answer that because it matters a lot, and we've had uh, spirited discussions about that. Um, if you have input or thoughts on that, I'm all ears. I mean, we're, again, we take input from people right now, but reasonable minds are differing. And right now we have a, we have a little bit of a phenomenon on the JVM that if we put three fairly smart people in the room about JVM, we're getting four opinions. <laughs> I'll come back to you. I'm going to rotate around so I can... I think I got most of your question, but try, try it again. Okay. We had an election for mayor about a month ago. Two weeks before the election, one of the candidates that was advancing the leader was going to be the candidate. Two weeks before the election, the leader of the candidate was talked off the ballot. Two days later, he was the leader of the state. Right. So, the new design, I mean, the new design system focused on that, so Right. So, so the question is, if, if you have some, some uh, uh, chaos at the last moment and there's a change, does, does this technology allow us to change the cycle time for ballot design, layout, and production? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's the problem of having committed ballots to ink you know, weeks ago because of production schedules. JIT, or just in time, redefines how, how that happens. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm well aware of the Emanuel saga. Um, I think it had a happy ending, depending upon which side of the, the fence you're on. Uh, two things. One, uh, in speaking about the old way, I know currently... Uh, you know, I have to interrupt you. There's something about you being an election official and that, those horns flashing <laughs> on your hat. Maybe we could turn that around rally style while you ask the question. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to have that image in my, in my mind all the way back to San Francisco tonight, but, but, but go ahead. <laughs> So, so the question is, 
great, great technology. How does it actually get deployed? And, and, and a, an important question. So a couple comments about that. So one thing that we know, and the reason we're pushing so hard on this project right now, is that the majority of jurisdictions across the United States are coming up to renew and replace their equipment. That is, it's just being amortized out and they have got to replace things and they are planning to replace things before the 2016 election. Um, we know that 2012, uh, there's a considerable number of precincts that are going to be changing out equipment. So the reason we're pushing this project now is that we know that these states and counties are going, are looking. Right now, Los Angeles County is sitting on top of $88 million of leftover HAVA money that they've never spent because they want an entirely new system and they refuse to purchase from one of the two vendors which means they're going to have to either build it in-house or partner with someone or something to build it. LA County is the largest jurisdiction in the United States. Four million voters, 3,000 ballot styles, seven languages. It's an enormous system and central count, by the way, central tabulation. So. We are building an architecture that's intended to be deployed on commodity hardware. We'll specify those, hard, the hard, we'll make the hardware specs known, they'll be part of the repository, but imagine, you know, they'll, they'll be uh, Fujitsu scanners or HP scanners, there'll be a whole list of scanners that at a basic hardware level will have, you know, spec'd out and then our software gets loaded onto it. The cost issue is what's being dropped dramatically here. So a minute ago I mentioned $3,000 per seat for the typical ES&S poll book solution right now. Our pull book solution is $399 per seat. That is the cost of an Apple iPad. Because the entire, opera, the entire uh, application software that runs on it is all open source, all part of the OSDV Foundation's Trust the Vote project. So 3,000 to 399. That's just, that's just one example. So by bringing that total cost of ownership down, we're giving jurisdictions an opportunity. Oh, I'm going to continue around the, the room here. Go ahead. I, I sense an enterprising individual down here. Good man. So let me, let me address that. So, so there are three steps. Adoption, adaptation, and deployment. Okay? So we do the heavy lifting of building the reference code base in the technology. And then a state, say the state of Minnesota, um, I can neither confirm or deny, but well, I can neither confirm or deny what Mark Ritchie has up his sleeve. But let's just say the state of Minnesota decides that they want to adopt the open source elections technology framework from the Trust the Vote project. And they're going to put out an RFP to have somebody come in take that software, load it onto the hardware that we specify, and deploy it, okay? Now, the adaptation step is we've built a general purpose framework. They have local regulations that they have to have to, that require certain modifications to be made. They will let a contract to hire somebody to come in and work on that code base to make those modifications so that the adaptation step can be completed. And then a systems integrator is gonna come in and do the deployment step. Right? So, if we do our job and things work out well, there is going to be a really nice opportunity for enterprising software developers who want to become TTV, elections technology framework experts, and know that entire architecture inside and out and can go hire themselves out to say, oh, Dade County, Florida, you want to use this ballot marking device and this type of tabulator. We know what your rules are about tabulation count and recount, and I will make the necessary code modifications to do that because I just happen to specialize in the TTV tabulator. Oh, my buddy up in North Carolina actually knows the marker device inside and out because he develops for Apple iPads. So we'll write a proposal and we'll compete for the contract to go do that. That's what's going to happen. It already is happening. It happened in Virginia. It happened in D.C. It's happening in New Mexico. And we hope to hell it happens everywhere. Is 
Right. So, so real quickly about that. Remember that elections are a local thing, and I'll guarantee you that every jurisdiction has their own ideas and steadfast about it. But here's our thinking. Um, bear in mind that we're an older lot in this open source group, at least the core team is, right? So most of us were around during the days of the ARPANET and CSNet. Um, I worked on the NSFNet. Um, have we told everybody 20 years ago, thou shall all throw out ring topology and use IP-based networks, right? What do you think would happen? Nothing, nothing. Novell would have just rolled in the aisles laughing, right? So what happened instead was, we just kept putting that thing out there, letting people write to it, and, and people start saying, gosh, you know, maybe I'd have a TCP IP stack. Maybe I'd have a gateway. Well, fast forward 20 years, and that thing has organically become the standard by which the world runs now, right? We're hoping in a similar fashion that this framework, when you get enough jurisdictions using it, they start seeing some common grounds. Because real quickly, understand how our licensing, system, our licensing model works, right? So you take the OPL, you, Los Angeles County, right? And you in Dade County say, I'm going to take the OPL. Well, when you take the OPL, the OSDB public license, what you're getting is access to every single innovation that occurs in the framework anywhere in the country. And we've already seen this happen where Washington says, say, state of Washington says, I really dig what they did in Virginia on this one thing about ballot distribution. I think I'm going to start doing it that way too. Right? And so trends become a momentum. The license enforces the notion of adoption and adaptation. And whatever you contribute to the pile, everyone else gets to pick over and use if they want to. So we think over time, this thing, if it's properly tended, if this garden is properly fertilized and tended and pruned, it's going to grow up and it's going to spread. All right, next question was around here. I, got, I thought I had until 12.15, no? Oh, well, then I managed to run over. And we had such a great set of questions. Can I take one more? All right, one more question. Ah. <sighs> Shoot, decisions, decisions. All right, so I'll tell you what. I'm going to take a new question, but follow on, guys can see me afterwards. Bearing in mind that I'm going to be heading downstairs to catch a cab like at 1222 on the street to the airport, but go ahead. Yes, it is. We certainly are advancing um, the uh, you know weak copyright or strong copy left. And I encourage you to go uh, take a look at the OPL. Uh, and the rationale document behind it, because uh, it's just like the Mozilla public license. Okay. Thanks.